Hello and welcome to another Aston Originals podcast and they've invited us back. Who, who would have thought it? But here we are for as part of the Aston Institute for Membrane Excellence. Um, I am Dr. Matt Derry. I'm a lecturer in chemistry here at Aston University. I'm part of AIM, the Aston Institute for Membrane Excellence. And today I have with me the wonderful Professor Rosalind Bill, who's the 50th anniversary professor of biotechnology here at Aston. They've invited us back. Who would have thought it? Amazing. Amazing. I can't believe it. Great. So we're here today to talk about an amazing project that you've had and has started since the 1st of January, I believe. So can you tell us just generally a little bit about this project? Yeah. So it's an ERC advanced grant. Um, very, very exciting. And it's to allow me to spend five years trying to understand how uh, the way that water gets into and out of our brain can be understood so that we might use that information to know whether we can intervene or not as we age and are more likely to get dementia. So an ERC advanced grant, I believe it's called Fortify. That's so right. can you yep. tell me about the scheme, the ERC advanced grant scheme? Like, What did you have to do to get this award? Yep. So um, ERC is the European Research Council. Uh, it is a standalone council within the um, European-wide research network and the way that the Europeans fund research. So you apply to that scheme. Uh, they have three levels. They have one called starter, one called consolidation, one called advanced for old lags like me. Um, and the idea is that you propose something that they think is high risk, but high reward. So if it works, it would be great for society and for science. And you have to write a proposal that has to be then judged by other scientists, European scientists, lots of them usually. And then if they think that they're interested, they ask you to go and have an interview. Um, that's the most uh, intimidating part of the process because you have to stand up in front of uh, a large number of people. I think there might have been 15 or 20 people on my panel wow. and answer questions. I had to do it remotely. Um, and I assume I was this sort of big lurking presence on the screen and there were people around the table. Uh, so that was exciting and, and uh, a little bit trepidating. Uh, and then on the basis of that, they make a short list and then they make the awards. And I was really happy to find out that I'd been awarded one of these grants. Well, um, that's certified legend status, I think. <laughs> You're yeah. too kind. And then the funding was ultimately underwritten by UKRI, the UK yes. Research and Innovation Council. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. During the time when um, after Brexit, when we weren't sure what was happening with our funding, uh, it was re really great that the government stepped in and said, if anybody's awarded one of these types of grants, then we will make sure that those grants are paid from the government coffers and so that's what they did they, they underwrote that yeah that's great and speaking of your legend status i uh, i believe this work was inspired or the foundations of this work were laid by a breakthrough paper in 2020 in cell yes that was during um the lockdown so that was published um when we were all not in uh, the r university so yeah um i i published a, an important paper for me and for some of the younger scientists who work in my team uh, in this pretty prestigious uh, journal called cell uh, and there we were able to show that we understood how brains swell up after injury has occurred. Like if you've had, for example, a traumatic brain injury, uh, you know, you've had a fall or something like that, a bang on the head, or if you've had a stroke. And we started to understand why that happens. Amazing. So just for the perhaps non-specialists, paint a picture of how big a deal it is to get a paper in cell. Um, well, I guess there are a number of journals that everybody dreams that maybe one day they might publish in. Uh, there's a handful of them and Cell is one of them. And it feels like a, a career defining moment. I mean, for me, it certainly was a career defining moment to publish in a journal like that. Uh, and I had a number of uh, collaborators on there and a number of uh, postdoctoral and PhD students who worked in the lab. And for them, it can really make a massive difference to their careers. I think it was really important for me to get this ERC grant to have had that paper, to have had the coverage uh, that you get when you publish uh, in a journal like that. It's been uh, what happens in science is when you uh, publish an important paper, other people hopefully take note of it, hopefully in a positive way. I mean, they might read it and think it's a load of rubbish, mm -hmm. um, but hopefully they read it and think it's great. And then that means when they publish their own work, they might refer to your work. They call that citing you. So it's had lots of citations, uh, which hopefully means it's been well received. I'm so, sure it has. Yeah. And it's it's really good and important to acknowledge, as you have done, the, the team effort here. So there's a lot of researchers in our teams that we basically are indebted to yes absolutely it's you know I think sometimes when we have conversations like this the assumption might be that it's all about me and my science but for me science is and always has been and will continue continue to be a, a team game and I think just to give another plug for AIM that's what we want to achieve in AIM it's it's all about team science it's about 
allowing people to do their best work and for people to make contributions according to the way they can. And then we work together just to, you know, make great discoveries together and hopefully have a really positive impact on society. Absolutely. So you've plugged it. So that's it. So yeah, job aim, aim is going to be great. Please yes. keep an eye out for the uh, vacancies that are currently available. Um, closing date is the end of this month, April 2024. So uh, yeah, have a look out for that. We'll share the link with this video. So moving on to the project specifically. So tell me a little bit about it. So it's about dementia and studying how dementia comes about and the onset of dementia, right? Yeah, absolutely. So um, a lot of the work that I'm interested in is about how the fluids in our brain are in the right place at the right time. <clears throat> I think we'll probably come a, a bit later on to what happens when that goes wrong after an injury. But for the project itself, it's about understanding how the, the, the flow of the fluids through your brain, predominantly water, because we're mostly water, as you know, as, as, as humans, how that water flow through the brain and how those flows change. So we know that when we sleep, our brain effectively has the equivalent um, of a, I guess, a dishwasher action. It has to get rid of all the rubbish because when we think and when we do all the things we do, we create all sorts, all sorts of waste products. There's one that people might have heard of called amyloid beta. <clears throat> so amyloid is a waste product that builds up in the brain and that can lead to a, a disease called Alzheimer's that I, I imagine a lot of people have heard of. So we know that when amyloid builds up in the brain, that that can lead to dementia. So dementia caused by Alzheimer's, for example. So we know that happens. <clears throat> we also know that it's got something to do with this lack of efficiency of the clearing of the waste products in the brain through the way the fluids flow. And we know all of this is to be the, is the case, but we don't really understand the detail of how it happens. So we don't understand what's known as the mechanism. That's a sort of sequence of events that causes something like that to happen. So how is it that the fluids go through our brain and how is it that they can get rid of that waste that builds up during the day as we get older it seems that our ability to get rid of the waste gets poorer and so i'm really interested in understanding why that is because if we can understand the real detail of how that happens and why it happens we can hopefully stop it from happening or even if we can't stop it we can slow it from happening and the idea would be then to slow the onset of hopefully what isn't inevitable, but for many people, unfortunately, it is. And that is that we will eventually perhaps get dementia. So if we could stave that off, that will be a great outcome. Amazing. The dishwasher analogy is a great one for me. I mean, obviously, the older your dishwasher gets, the less efficient it gets. Unfortunately, we yes. can't quite so easily change yes. and completely replace our brains here. So yep. dishwasher maintenance, right? Dishwasher maintenance. Yes, absolutely. One way to maintain your dishwasher is to get a good night's sleep. So I think if we take anything from this podcast today is Try as hard as you can to make sure that you get good quality sleep because that's when all of this dishwashing, brainwashing is happening and you're getting rid of all of the waste products. Great. And everyone will have heard of dementia. I don't doubt it. So it's clearly quite prevalent. But how prevalent is it exactly? Well, when I was writing my proposal, I was looking for statistics that might really hit home with people. And the one that, that hit home with me that is that every three seconds, someone in the world develops dementia. Okay. So one, two, three, bang, someone has developed dementia. That is quite something, I think. And the thing about it is there's really nothing we can do to stop that from happening. And so the idea of my project is if we can understand how it's happening, or at least how, how it's happening in part, because obviously people are complicated, brains are complicated. So there's never usually just one fix to things. But at least if we can find something out about how it happens, we have a chance to stop it or slow it. Okay, great. So I believe there's a kind of an unexpected start to the story of this project. So we're talking about dementia and studying the onset of dementia, see if we can delay it. But how did the project come about? Yeah, well, so we, we started at the beginning talking about that cell paper. So that cell paper was actually about um, what happens after you've had a bang on the head, an injury or a stroke. So it doesn't in initially feel like it's going to be about the same thing. But as it turns out, spoiler alert, um, the way that that happens, is, I think, is related to how our dishwasher works. So the project that started all of this was looking at how our brain swells up after an injury. And I think a lot of you will be familiar with Michael Schumacher. So yeah. this is the, the Formula One racing driver. Um, poor man. He had a skiing accident. He was actually wearing a helmet. Uh, but nonetheless, he just got unlucky. And he had a, what's called a traumatic brain injury. <clears throat> so as a result of that, his brain swelled up, 
And as we know, um, because our brain sits in this hard skull here, as the brain swells up, you get an increase in pressure in your head because you know the, the tissue's got nowhere to go. And when things go badly wrong and we can't control this swelling, sometimes people end up having to go into neurosurgery and having part of their skull removed so the tissue can just swell up. And then you just have to wait for it to subside. And I saw this as a, a fluid problem, a fluid, you know, where's all the fluid going? How's, where, how is it getting into the brain? Um, and can we understand how to stop that? So that's where this story starts. Yeah, so brain swelling is clearly not good. So why does it occur? So that was the question, why does it occur? Um, we know it's about fluid. We know it's about water, probably. Um, and what we started to understand was that your brain is made up of lots of millions of, of little cells. There are some special cells, they're called astrocytes, and they look like stars, astro. Uh, and they really are the cells that protect the brain and protect the important neurons where all of the actions happening, you know, the way we think and the way we do things. So what, what was known was that these are the cells that swell up. So the question was, how do they swell up and why do they swell up after an injury? And so the work that I did was explaining how that happens, how the water gets in, uh, in and how actually after the initial water inflow, how that seems to somewhat counterintuitively cause more water to come in. And we realized that we actually could understand the detailed mechanism, those detailed sequence of events that A goes to B goes to C goes to D that ultimately causes the swelling to occur. And we realized that if we intervened at one of these points, we could stop the whole mechanism, that whole sequence of events from happening and stop the swelling from happening. And that was the breakthrough. Amazing. So I want to tap into that a little bit more, but in a basic level, yeah. but I want to tee you up to talk about your, your favorite transmembrane protein, yes. the, the aquaporin. Yes. So, um, yeah, how what is aquaporin and what's its role in this process? So aquaporins are, are you know, I think we've got a picture of one here. We do. Um, aquaporins are literally the best membrane proteins in the world. I think some people would disagree with me, but folks, they're wrong. <laughs> uh, aquaporins are just the best. Aquaporins are little channel proteins. So, so what that means is if you think about a cell and you think about what a cell looks like, think of it like a balloon. And it's got this very thin membrane around the outside that keeps everything in the right place. In the case of the balloon, it's air, air on the inside, as well as air on the outside. In the case of a cell, it's going to be water and components on the inside as well as on the outside. But what's different about a cell, of course, is that, you know, you need certain things inside, all the various nutrients, et cetera, and hopefully most of the waste products outside. But things have to get in and out. You can't just have that cell sitting there statically all the time you know cells are machines and they're doing all sorts of stuff so various molecules need to get into and out of those cells at the right time and one of those molecules is water water is essential for life we can go especially somebody like me can go days without food i've got plenty of fat stores so i could live a long time with without food but if i go without water for just a number a small number of days i'll die it's it's essential to life yes so what we need to be able to do then is really control how water gets into and out of cells. It's really important in the brain because that's probably the most important of the organs. In, you know, you are your brain, essentially. Your brain is you. So what we know is that there are these little tiny proteins. There are 13 in the human body. But the most interesting one in my mind and it, literally in my head is aquaporin 4. So it's the fourth member of the family. And it controls how water gets into and out of these special star-shaped cells, these astrocytes. And we know that that, I guess, hopefully many of you will remember osmosis. So osmosis is that flow of water through a semi-permeable membrane. I can still remember that from my GCSEs. So yes. It's called O-levels <laughs> when I did them. Uh, so, you know, you just get water running through these little holes. They're a bit like uh, doors or windows. If you think of that balloon analogy again, that balloon metaphor. You've got your membrane around the outside of the balloon. And then you've got little holes. I guess a good way to think about it was, you know, if you stick a bit of sticky tape on a balloon, you can stick a, a needle through and make a little hole. Um, and so imagine if that was now a cell, you've got water on the inside and on the outside, you've got various concentrations, and then the water can either go from the outside in or from the inside out, depending on how much of whatever it is, is in the and, inside or the outside. And these aquaporins are exquisitely selective for water so only yeah. water will pass only water. Through them. so there are two types <clears throat> ones there are the ones like aquaporin 4 that are exquisitely selective for water so only water can go through nothing else um there are some other types that can also transport other important molecules like glycerol um they're not in 
in the brain. Uh, well, one of them might be, but the, the one we're interested in. Sure. Is called aquaporin, and it's exquisitely selective, so only water can get through. So these things, aquaporins, are clearly very important, and yep. you said there's 13 in our body. Are they found elsewhere in nature? Uh, yes, they are. Um, so if you think about, first of all, the human body, they're found everywhere, um, and there are 13, and they're in different combinations in different parts of the body. So you might have one, four, and nine somewhere, and three, four, and five somewhere else. Um, in nature, they're found in plants, they're found in bacteria. So anywhere there's a living organism, there will be an aquaporin somewhere. Right. Okay. Yeah. Important molecules. Yes, clearly. So kind of just to bring it back now, because we talked about your project and it's all about dementia. And then we talked about brain trauma, Michael yeah. Schumacher's yeah. example, and then brain swelling. So how does this all link up? Okay. So what we realized was that the way that water gets into and out of cells normally is through aquaporins, aquaporin 4 in the brain. And we realized that after an injury, when various things happen in the brain, that that changes. So one of the things we noticed was that after an injury, for a variety of reasons, you get suddenly a situation where your astrocytes are even more permeable to water than they would be normally. So you, normally you'd have a certain number of these aquaporins in your membrane. And after injury, we realized and understood the, the sequence of events that occur. So you make your your membrane even more permeable. You get more of these aquaporins in the in the surface. So instead of having a certain number, you might have three times as many or four times as many. So that's somewhat counterintuitive because obviously after your uh, injury, <clears throat> you really wouldn't want your brain to swell up. But somehow, biology is encouraging the brain to swell up because suddenly your cells become more permeable to water. That causes them to swell up more, and that's what causes that very dangerous tissue swelling and ultimately pressure buildup in the head. So we showed actually that we could stop that from happening, which was very exciting. Um, and we, that's what we published in our paper. But then I started to think, well, that can't be the sole purpose for this sequence of events happening in the first place. In the human body, pathways like that are normally there for a very fundamental purpose. And in injury isn't really a fundamental purpose. It's an unfortunate side effect of being alive. So there must be a more basic reason for that sequence of events to be able to happen. And I started to think about what could that be? And I started to understand that there are lots of links between what happens after injury and the way in which we've started to think about how this dishwasher works. Okay. So there are sorts of various different stretches and strains that happen in the cells. There are certain differences in the environment of cells. And there are, there are lots of similarities and links and lots of analogies. And I started to understand that having really unpicked that sequence of events in the injury part of the world, Maybe now they could be applied to understanding what happens when we go to sleep. And I can see now there are some really interesting crossovers there because what we understand on this side after injury, we can apply to this side when we're sleeping. And if we can do that and we could intervene here like we did in the injury situation, maybe we can use that to slow cognitive decline. Great. So it's very much a case of cognitive decline happens but your research is aiming to slow down that process yeah. such that we can live longer, healthier lives before we have to worry about anything like dementia. Yes, exactly, exactly. The, the analogy I think about is as you get older, perhaps you know yourself or, or somebody you know in your family or friends take statins. You know, we t the people take statins every day in order to try and keep our cholesterol under control. So yeah. that's really well established and it's really effective when people do that. My thought would be, if we can understand how to keep our dishwasher, brain dishwasher, really working as nicely as it can for as long as possible, then perhaps we could develop a drug that could do that too in the same way. And the thing that is clear is that as we get older, <clears throat> we don't sleep as well. We also know that we get, we tend to get stiffer vessels, you know, our blood pressure often increases. And all of these changes, these sort of physical, mechanical changes in our body contribute i think to the lack of effectiveness of our dishwasher so your dishwasher is probably working much better than mine is uh, my daughter's dishwasher is probably working a lot better than yours is you know as, as we get older we definitely get not as good at, as clearing out waste and that is probably why we develop these dementias as we get older it's one of the reasons that we develop them okay so if we could keep our dishwasher running as effectively as possible i'm, I'm really liking this, yeah, this me metaphor too. now keep, you know keep keep, adding, putting your rinse aid in putting your salt in you know if we could do if we could find a drug that's the equivalent of keeping the salt in or putting in rinse aid so that the dishwasher is working well 
then we really would have a chance of just delaying the onset of that dementia. That's the idea. Great. So we talked about things being a team effort, your team of researchers, and I'm sure you'll have that here at Aston as well. Um, I understand there's external collaborators involved in the project too. Yes. Yeah. I'm very lucky. So I work with um, a guy called Jeff Iliff. He works in Seattle. Um, and he was one of the um, original discoverers of this, this dishwasher mechanism. That, um, he worked with a really famous scientist called Mike Niedergaard, who discovered this dishwasher. Um, it's called the glymphatic system. So I work with Jeff, and he has an interest um, in how this contributes to developing Alzheimer's. He, he runs a big program in the States. And then I also have a, another collaborator at Oxford called Mutaz Salman. And Mutaz um, is a, at an earlier stage in his career, a really talented a uh, scientist and I've worked with him for many years. He was one of the, the authors on that cell paper. So that's exciting to bring together expertise both in the UK, but also overseas in the US. Yeah, I mean, the reason why I brought that up just to echo that science is really a collaborative effort. Yes. Like we, we don't each have all of the expertise required to make such a difference. So yeah, Absolutely. It's, it's yes, vital. It is. And it's exciting. It makes science more interesting. It's much more fun to work in a team than to sit stroking your chin and thinking beautiful thoughts. And, you know, you you always benefit from conversations with other people, different perspectives. And usually these days, because science is so fast moving, you need specific expertise. And Jeff and Mutas have that. And we all bring something together. Yeah. And bringing that back to AIM, what we're doing here at Aston, that's exactly the kind of thing we're yes. doing here, bringing together people from the College of Engineering and Physical Sciences and yes. where I sit, yeah. the College of Health and Life Sciences, where, where you sit. And yes. really trying to speak a common language, but with very different skill sets absolutely and different perspectives as well i think it's really nice so i know for example i've tried to train you in in biology uh, you, you're doing yep. an amazing job oh, thank Matt, you you've been very kind <laughs> but you know my first degree was in chemistry so i've i've diffused over to the biosciences but you know i'm a molecular scientist at heart but one of the other colleagues that i work really closely with is called phil kitchen he has a fellowship here works i host him in my lab he's a physicist by training uh, and then I have a lot of people who, for example, have done pharmacy as their first degree in the group. So it's really nice to get those different perspectives because people will come at things and see perhaps something that one of us hasn't seen. And, and I think building that, that's absolutely the ethos of AIM, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I echo everything yeah. you said there. So um, clearly this project fits it in the ethos of AIM because it's talking about membrane proteins. And yes. the M of AIM is membrane. So yes. What kind of kind of tangential projects do you think might shoot from this or, or what other projects within this remit are, are, are being investigated currently? Yeah. So, I mean, I guess from my own scientific interest, one of the things that we've definitely been looking to do, working with, with some of the pharmacy colleagues in, in my team, is to understand how we might be able to make future drugs. So we've both got the kind of traumatic brain injury. Imagine if we could have had a drug that we could have given somebody like Michael Schumacher you know, a few hours after his injury, so we could have stopped that brain swelling from happening. Imagine we could do that to people that have a car traffic accident or, or a fall or a stroke or an, an injury on the football field or something like that. Because often the problem is, a bit like the, the dementia we were talking about, you want to stop something from happening in the first place. It's one thing to try and manage the symptoms after they've happened, but the damage has already been done there. If you can, if you can st put a stop to it, then that's where you need to be. So we're focused on developing molecules that might be future drugs one day. I hope we can do that for the dementia side yeah. of thing as well. Um, but then of course we've got the fun things, the sort of things that then interface with your expertise. So one of the, my stated aims is to make everybody love aquaporins. Um, and of course what we know is these are exquisitely selective proteins or they're members of the family that are. So then we can take the knowledge that we have of how these proteins work in cells and try and apply them to interesting applications in biotechnology. And this is where the sort of work that you do comes in, where you can develop plastic membranes, polymer membranes, and then take learning from the biology and try and make really, really good ways of purifying water, for example. Sure. So and that, that might be a good teaser to a future podcast. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Teed up, teed up yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there's some very exciting work done by our colleagues, including you, Matt, that, that look at work like that. So I think what we have in AIM is people that have an interesting biological problem and they want to understand it and apply it for societal good. So that's where I think I would sit. Um, and then we have technical experts who are really interested in pushing the boundaries of, of how we can develop new molecules so that we can study individual proteins like the aquaporins, or we can uh, make, maybe make new plastic polymers so that we can take the learnings from those proteins and 
and do interesting things that we didn't think would be possible. So I think there are loads of applications for, you know, medical benefits, environmental benefits, you know, and I know you're interested in green chemistry. You know, we've got all sorts of opportunities to to think about things like that as well. Yeah, absolutely. And then finally, to bring it back to your project. So what I'm getting from this is the dishwasher analogy mm -hmm. is really stuck in my, well, excuse the pun, stuck <laughs> in my mind now. Yeah. So we need to maintain our dishwashers and yes. your, your research will hopefully give us an understanding of the pathways by which that happens when we yes. sleep. So yes. sleep is really important. Yes. So that's our dishwasher maintenance, yes, if you like, but absolutely. also leading a healthy lifestyle. I imagine things like this yes. diet and things like that will absolutely yeah. help. Absolutely. So yeah. dishwasher maintenance, keep your dishwasher healthy for longer yes. and then beat off the onset of dementia. Absolutely. Get Got a it. good night's sleep. Keep that dishwasher topped up. That's the, the route to a, a good life, I think. Perfect. And I think that's a good way to wrap up. So thank you so much for your time, Roz. It's been great hearing about your project. I wish you all the best for it. Looking forward to seeing the results coming out. Brilliant. And thank you, everyone. That's been another Aston Originals podcast here with me, Matt Derry, and I look forward to seeing you next time.